Dear friends, it's a joy to share uh, these three Bible studies with you. It's so good we can meet together across our two dioceses, both in person and virtually, in Oxford and in Kimberley and Kuruman. We really cherish this partnership in God's mission, so thank you for being here. I've chosen three passages from the book of Ezekiel for these three studies, although I will draw in uh, some other material. The studies are on the three themes, first of the rebuilding after the pandemic, second on gender justice and what it means to be a person, and third on the environment and creation. And we begin today with the picture of the Valley of the Dry Bones from Ezekiel 37. The second study is on the picture of a new heart from Ezekiel 11, and we'll also be referencing Matthew 7, 1 to 12. And the third is on the river of life in Ezekiel 47. I've called this little series of studies journeying with Ezekiel. I really hope and pray it will be helpful. So let us pray. Dear Lord, bless this time together and our studies. We pray through the living Christ. Amen. So welcome to the first of our studies as we journey with Ezekiel uh, to the Valley of the Dry Bones. The context of all three passages we'll be exploring in Ezekiel is a political and theological and national catastrophe. Jerusalem has been destroyed by the armies of Babylon. The Temple of Solomon has been razed to the ground. Many of the people of Israel have been taken into exile thousands of miles from their home in Babylon. By the waters of Babylon, they weep and lament. Together, the people of Israel are trying to understand this disaster which has happened to them. To some, it seems as though the gods of the nations are more powerful than the God of Israel. So this is a theological crisis as well as a political crisis. To some, it seems that God is punishing and judging Israel and therefore there can be no hope of return and new beginnings and resurrection. Ezekiel is uncompromising in his condemnation of the sins of the nation in the early part of his prophecy. There's no doubt as to why this disaster has come upon Israel. Israel has not been faithful to the Lord. But Ezekiel is also uncompromising in his steadfast hope. God has not abandoned God's people. God is present in Babylon with the exiles. God has a future for the nation which is not grounded in the nation's goodness, but in God's grace alone. In Kimberley and Kurman and in Oxford, in different ways, we are continuing to live with the legacy of the COVID pandemic. Recovery is taking longer than we imagined in the beginning. There is a legacy of illness and grief, of tiredness, of changing habits, of living in the aftermath of disaster. Ezekiel is called to minister in a time like this. He ministers to exiles living far from home in Babylon, the people who were once set free are now captives. The people of the promised land are far from home, with no prospect of ever returning. The people called by God feel abandoned and far away, surrounded by idols and cut off from their source of life. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land, they lament. So how does Ezekiel set about the task of rebuilding and rekindling hope? Ezekiel does not offer empty words of comfort or false platitudes. He's very, very clear that the nation has abandoned God, but he's also very clear that God has not abandoned Israel. Even though there is no prospect of return and restoration and rebuilding on the horizon, humanly speaking, there is hope. Ezekiel's greatest contribution to theology is in his theology of hope. Hope does not rest on trends or evidence. Hope does not rest on our virtue or good deeds. Hope does not rest on our clever plans and strategies or having powerful allies and partnership. Hope rests solely on the grace of God. Many Christians become confused between optimism and hope. They're not the same thing. 
Optimism is a mood, the feeling we have when the sun is shining and all is right with the world. There's nothing wrong with optimism, but it can disappear when the clouds come over and the rain starts to fall. So hope for the Christian is not a mood, but a virtue. We're called to hope all the time, even as we're called to love all the time, in season and out of season. Why? Because our hope rests on the power of God and not on ourselves. Ezekiel captures all of this in the picture of the Valley of the Dry Bones. The picture is similar in some ways to the river of life we'll come to. We begin with a picture of death and desolation. This great army of people that lies dead and lifeless, just as the desert and the stagnant sea have no life. These people have not died recently. They've died, their flesh is gone, their clothes have rotted, their bones have bleached white in the sun, their parts are scattered across the valley. There's no prospect of recovery. Ezekiel is told to prophesy first to the bones. Mortal, can these bones live? O oh Lord God, you know. It's a question we might ask of a church, of a community, of a nation. Can these dry bones live? Ezekiel is obedient and speaks God's word to the bones. O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. So I prophesied, as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied suddenly, there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. This is the first part of the rebuilding. It's a rebuilding based on the sure foundation and the life-giving power of the Word of God. It's a stage-by-stage -stage rebuilding, a little at a time. We might identify with some of the rebuilding we're doing after COVID, reconnecting the church, the body of Christ, starting again from the ground up, taking the skeleton of the body of Christ and growing ligaments and sinews and flesh and skin. In Ephesians 4, Paul refers to ministers as the ligaments and sinews in the body of Christ, perhaps thinking of this passage. Sometimes this kind of building takes many years. It's good to remember that the people of Judah spent 70 years in exile in Babylon. But then there is the second dramatic stage. The bodies are whole again, but they're not alive. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied, as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood on their feet, a vast multitude. A vital key to understanding this passage is to know that the Hebrew word ruach means breath, and wind, and spirit. The three are the same root word and concept. Wind and breath and spirit are all rolled together in this passage. It's the spirit which gives life to those who've died, God's spirit, which needs to breathe afresh upon God's church, these dry bones, so that they might come to life and live again. Ezekiel's hope is remarkable. We read Ezekiel's prophecy in the light of the two great New Testament events. The first is the resurrection of Jesus on Easter Day. New life is brought to the dead. Ezekiel imagines resurrection in his great picture and foreshadows the great resurrection when all those who will have died in Christ will rise to new and eternal life with God. The second great event is the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost when the sound of a mighty wind fills the room and tongues of flame appear on the heads of the disciples and they speak in new languages. Ezekiel is forging hope in the people of God without the benefit of Easter Day or Pentecost. But his images shape our understanding of resurrection and the gift of the Spirit. God is the one who rebuilds and restores. And God is the one who gives new life. Why does God do this? 
What's the purpose of the vision? Well, Ezekiel tells us in the very next verse. Listen carefully. Then he said to me, Mortals, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. I don't know if you can hear echoes of that song in the life of the church today. Our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We're cut off completely. That is, to a greater or lesser extent, our song. The stuffing has been knocked out of us. We're winded. We're knocked out and on the mat. And what good does God say to us, and especially to Christian ministers? God says, therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I will act, says the Lord. Not because of who we are or what we've done or our skill or our virtue, but because this is the very nature of God. Where does rebuilding and renewal begin? Renewal begins with the rekindling of hope and purpose and vision. And the rekindling of hope and purpose and vision begins when just one person begins to sing a different song. No longer the song of despair, we are dried up and our hope is lost, but the song of joy and hope and new life. That's in the midst of the hard work of gathering and placing bone on bone and rebuilding structures. This is the work of spiritual renewal, of seeking God, of finding the stream in the desert and seeing life in the world around us. It's time for the church to sing that different song.